Okay, y'all, I have 6.30, so we'll go ahead and get, get started tonight. Um, some of you may remember last year we, we did this as kind of an introductory class because I was throwing around a lot of words um, like the chemistry, chemical components of plants, and I was getting a lot of questions about what all those words meant. So I thought as we started off our month of August, as we get into herbs, that it would be a good refresher to kind of talk about some of those and utilize plants as illustrations as to what all those phytochemical properties are within plants, hence the name of tonight's class, The Power of Plants, because it's really kind of cool when we start really delving deep into these plants and their historical origins and, and what they're used for today, just truly how powerful they really are. So as always, if you have questions, pop those in the chat and we'll make sure we get those answered for you. And we'll get this up on the web portal within a couple of days. And um, just remember every Monday night in August, we've got something dealing with herbs. So we're just gonna kind of build on tonight's um, class. And Jenny's on here, so I'll pick on her since she's always so good at kind of um, running the chat and all that good stuff. So make sure you share anything to um, that the entire class could use as we go through um, tonight. Um, as always, just remember that a lot of the, the plants that we're talking about, uh, we're talking about those historical components because we know that plants, humans, health, society, and economics have always been um, intertwined. And it's just focusing on that uh, foundation. It just kind of helps put everything into a more general context. But just as a disclaimer, remember, I'm not a PhD or an MD, so a lot of the things that I'm going to be providing you to tonight are, in fact, just based on those historical elements, just to kind of make you aware, just giving you some reference points as we, as we move through this evening. So what do plants really give us? And again, I think this is pretty um, fabulous when we really dive into it, just to realize um, uh, the complexities of the plant um, kingdom. And so many plants um, have so many different uses. And so we're going to approach it a little bit differently than what we usually do for tonight. So phytochemistry, um, some people, that whole chemistry word scares a lot of people off, but um, it's, it's pretty much just put it into the context of the study of chemicals and plants and just what each one of those um, actually mean. And we're not going to have enough time to dive into all of these. Um, you'll notice here that terpenoids, we're not going to go into that tonight, but think about terpenes and um, hemp, you know, that's new on the horizon. We've heard a lot about that in the last um, several years, but uh, terpenes, we'll kind of leave that for another class. But those listed there on the left are kind of what we're going to dive into uh, tonight. And again, I'm going to use plants to illustrate um, each one of these phytochemical properties. So we're going to kind of start out with what I consider one of the fun ones is the alkaloids, because this is one where we have a lot of um, history and lore, um, plus some of the most toxic plants um, out there. But basically, in a nutshell, alkaloids are going to be any active organic compound that contains at least one nitrogen atom. So we're kicking it back uh, to those college days of organic chemistry that everybody dreaded so bad. But to put it in a more defined context, just think about morphine. Um, morphine, we know, is a pretty powerful painkiller, very potent, as you see there, and uh, are often the focus of pharmaceutical research. But when we talk about morphine, that's kind of where it all began, because it was the first individual alkaloid that we isolated from the poppy plant, uh, Popper somniferum. And you see that pictured there on the left. This is one that is quite prevalent in many of our landscapes, um, even today. But it was isolated in 1804 from the opium poppy. And then there on the right, this is a member of the nightshade family, which is the belladonna plant. Sometimes you'll actually hear it called nightshade, but it is the belladonna. And from this, we get two um, derivatives, which are atropine and scopolamine. Um, and sometimes you'll actually hear this called the atropa plant too, kind of depending on uh, where you're located. But atropine is actually the active ingredient in Lamotil. So that's a prescription only uh, medication for diarrhea. It's also used in surgical procedures to help reduce um, saliva or any kind of mucus um, secretions in your airway, um, actually occurring during surgery, excuse me. It's also gonna be used as an antidote, which is kind of, um, kind of ironic, I guess, because this one is so potent itself, but it's used as an antidote for organophosphate or carbamate, um, 
poisoning or those uh, magical mushrooms, whatever the magical mushroom poisoning as well. And it's also going to be used to treat uh, bradycardia, which is a slow heart rate. Um, the other derivative is scopolamine, and that's going to be used for motion sickness. So think about bonine or dramamine. But again, scopolamine is going to be that prescription only medication that's used as a patch. It's just a little bit stronger than dramamine. And this plant, belladonna, actually naturally produces scopolamine, which is pretty cool. And not only that, it's been used uh, in rituals and religious ceremonies for years. So it's kind of um, cool. But basically how it works is that it blocks acetylcholine. It's an antagonist. And that's what actually causes the motion sickness. So that's how it works. Um, a couple more to make mention of when we talk about alkaloids. Uh, now, this is a plant you probably won't recognize. This is the strychnine plant. And this is the active ingredient that we use in rat poisoning today. So if you've ever heard of that, it actually is derived from a plant that you see pictured here. Um, another one is nicotine. Uh, we utilize this as a pesticide, um, but it's also, you can kind of see some of these um, chemical formulas here at the bottom. Uh, we know nicotine is going to be one of those alkaloids, but we also have three other alkaloids that are derived from that, and not to get into the, to the science of that, but we, um, anytime that tobacco undergoes a process called nitrization, nitrosamines are formed, and that's actually the bad stuff in tobacco. So that's why over the years there's been a lot of what we call cleaning the seed to reduce some of that uh, nitrization from occurring. So it helps reduce some of those secondary conversions, which more nicotine is actually going to be one of the, the worst, or the, it's, it's actually a worse alkaloid than what the actual nicotine is, um, which a lot of people don't realize that. But um, another pretty popular alkaloid that we see and it, of course, does have those um, habit-forming uh, receptors as well. Here's one that uh, you probably won't recognize either because this is going to be native to South America, more specifically Peru, but this is the chinchona tree, uh, which is where quinine comes from. And the quinine is actually extracted from the bark of the tree. And you'll notice here that you also get this in tonic water. You can actually see there where it says contains quinine. Uh, but it's extracted from the bark, which is kind of cool. Um, there is another alkaloid that's derived from this plant. It's called quinidine, and it's used for AFib or any um, other type of cardiac arrhythmia meds as well. And probably one of my favorite alka alkaloids is going to be uh, from this plant, Vinca minor. Uh, many of you know this plant. It's our periwinkle, but now there's many different cultivars of periwinkle. But just in a nutshell, um, within that Vinca family, we have 86 alkaloids that are derived from that plant. And the majority of those are being conducted in research trials now for chemotherapy treatment, and more specifically lymphoma. Um, that cancer, if you've ever heard of menoblastine, that chemotherapy is actually derived from the Madagascar periwinkle. Not the one you see here, but it is very closely related cousins. So some really great things happening uh, with a lot of these alkaloids. So even though they're very potent and utilizing chemotherapy drugs, um, it has helped prolonging the life of, you know, many, many patients. And a lot of those are plant-based. Many of you have heard me talk about May apple in the past. That's another one, the podophyllum. So there's um, several even plants native to our area that are being used in some of those research trials now. Um, alkaloid, we're spending a little bit of time on this one because um, it is so vast, but uh, two pictures here. The one on the left is one that we probably all start our day with. This is caffeine or coffee. So caffeine is going to be naturally found in the seeds, the nuts or leaves of many plants, not just coffee, um, but anything that's going to be native to East Asia, Africa, South America, and then even coffee grows in the U.S. on the island of Hawaii. Um, the cool thing about caffeine is that um, there's the substance. Caffeine actually helps protect them against predator in insects. So it's this natural defense mechanism that's built in. Plus, it prevents germination of nearby seeds as well. So it's kind of cool. Um, there's about 120 species of coffee worldwide. That's excluding the Keturah plants, which are also coffee. 
um, but also yerba made, if you've ever heard of that, or chocolate, those two are going to have caffeine, as well as tea. And if you remember a couple months ago, we talked about the difference between teas and tisanes, because a tea is actually anything that comes from that camellia plant, which does have caffeine, whereas a tisane is going to be any of our herbs that we're growing in our landscape. The nine times out of 10 are going to be naturally decaffeinated, and they're not coming from that camellia um, plant. So that's a big difference. There on the right, and you'll notice it's very similar to the coffee that you see there on the left. Um, that is actually a Roth, I can't ever say this word, y'all, erythroxylase, which is coca, not cocoa that we, that we drink, but actually cocaine. So we all know what kind of um, alkaloid that is, a very potent source, highly um, addictive. But all of those are going to have those alkaloids uh, within those plants, which makes them so powerful. Um, another component, another phytochemical element is going to be bitters. And you're going to see some similarities because many of these plants are going to kind of cross over a little bit. But the unique thing about bitters is that they have a very distinctive bitter taste. Oftentimes, you're going to find that toward the back of your, your throat. But the big thing about bitters is that they stimulate the appetite. So a bitter herb is going to be any herb that tastes bitter. Um, again, this is going to be one of those components that these plants were used for ceremonies, uh, for healing purposes, and then as well as cooking. And of course, dandelion that we see there on the left, we know that's a, a bitter green that we eat in the early uh, springtime into the summer months. Now, the thing about bitters is that they can mild or range from mild to pretty um, pungent. So chamomile is actually going to be a bitter, but it's very, very mild, whereas we have something like rue. If you're familiar with that plant, it's going to be really pungent. You're really going to know that that's a bitter plant. Um, again, the bitters are going to help stimulate or improve digestion, and they help counter inflammation within the digestive system. So just a few to make mention of besides uh, the ones you see pictured here, which are the dandelion and whorehound. We've got angelica, um, chamomile, golden seal, milk thistle, peppermint, wood sorrel, uh, wormwood, rue, and yarrow. Um, here's one of the most famous bitters. This is the wormwood or the Artemisia absinthum. So you can probably guess, wager a guess from that Latin name that um, it is the source for absinthe. So if any of you have ever had the pleasure of trying that magical green drink, which is pretty popular in New Orleans, um, it, it does in fact have a lot of folklore and history that's tied with that too, but it's um, very powerful, very intoxicating and incredibly bitter tasting. It will literally turn your tongue upside down when you try this stuff. So um, wormwood, it does have a chemical called thujone, and that is the main source of the bitterness, and that's what also makes it very toxic. So if you do try absinthe, um, go easy on that. You don't want to overindulge. Another pretty popular bitter is going to be hops. Uh, just as an FYI, hops is the only other plant in the cannabis family. Um, so it's going to be right there with hemp. But hops are going to be the ones that's known for giving beer its signature flavor. Um, otherwise, how boring would beer be? Um, a lot of people, well, I guess it's kind of a toss-up. You either like hops or you don't, depending on how well you like that bitter taste. Um, but it does produce a pretty powerful resin from the female flower bud that you see here. And it's that resin that's going to be the main source of that bitter flavor. And that's where we obtain that source of digestive um, system benefits and the ability to actually tone that vagus nerve, which is another huge benefit of hops. Not promoting beer, but just telling you all that's kind of one of the good uh, benefits of that. Now, the female is going to be the only ones that produce these cone-like flowers. Um, they're all, they're all, the females are the only one that's going to be used in the brewing process. Uh, the vines of hops, um, you can get those in either male or female, but if you do happen to, if you're growing these just as fun, the males, I should have put a picture on here, but they have a flower that's got five little um, white flowers. You want to pick those off because they're not going to do any good, and we actually want to encourage that female plant to be non-productive um, and only produce non-fertilized seed. And then another source of bitters is going to be for the Passover cedar ceremony. It's these bitter herbs that were um, used to symbolize, 
symbolize the embittered slavery that the Jews experienced in ancient Egypt. So the herbs are actually um, serving a ritualistic or ceremony, um, if you will, to just make sure that history is never forgotten and that it's taught each year at Passover, which it still is today. Uh, now the herbs are used today are a little bit different because today they use horseradish and actually uh, romaine lettuce. But do remember that in the Bible, there were many mentions of several plants. Um, I think it's about 128 times that we actually see herbs mentioned in the Bible. Um, but some of those, again, um, endive, coriander, wild lettuce. So there are several different mentions of that. But again, this is the Passover cedar or cedar ceremony. Again, one of our favorite bitters is probably going to be that morning cup of joe that we have. Uh, and just as an FYI, artichokes are also a pretty high, highly concentrated source of bitters as well. Um, another one that we briefly touched on a few weeks ago or a few months ago when we talked about herbs was essential oils. And we talked a little bit about the difference between essential oils and hydrosols. Uh, well, the essential oils are actually those concentrated uh, aromatic essence of the plants where you're obtaining the most benefit. Not only is it the fragrance, but that's where the actual health benefit, where we obtain that health value is actually coming from. And you'll notice there that it's what's providing that antiseptic protection for the plant as it grows. Uh, we have about 50 available essences to the public. Typically, we usually thought about aromatherapy as being delivered via massage, but now we also use that in uh, room sprays, incenses, um, toiletries, and then the aromatherapy that has uh, gained so much popularity here in the last several years. And this is just a chart kind of showing some of that. Um, one of the most famous uh, probably here as well as the United Kingdom is the lemon balm, uh, which folks over there do call it Melissa. Um, we know that it's an excellent source of tea as well as um, a pollinator plant as well. But the oil of Melissa or oil of lemon balm actually helps promote sleep. A couple of others to make mention of are frankincense and myrrh, and we know that these two were also um, listed in the Bible, uh, but Egyptians also use these in mummification. And I don't know if you can see the thorns on these shrubs, but uh, kind of a woody little devil as well. Their own self-defense mechanism built in um, externally as well as the oil itself. Um, but these essential oils are actually um, derived or extracted from the resin of the tree. And we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between resins and gums here in a few minutes. But when it gets down to the distillation process, distilling from a plant like this from the resin is actually a little bit easier than it would be um, some of the other plants that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, another essential oil that's pretty popular, and we don't really use this in uh, beauty products, is going to be the neem tree. Um, it is a biopesticide, and it's a member of the mahogany family. Uh, one of the essential oils that is probably the most expensive on the market is going to be the polyanthus tuberosa, which is the um, tuberose. Uh, the reason it's so expensive is because it takes about 60,000 roses to make an ounce of rose oil. So that's a lot of flowers. Um, another one of my favorites, y'all have heard me mention Lang Lang before. Very um, highly fragrant flowers, um, smells kind of like spicy jasmine a little bit. Um, and we actually will distill this um, fragrance by steam. And that's what goes into making perfumes and and lotions, hair oil, all that good stuff. And Lang Lang actually means a uh, flower of flowers. And if any of you ladies wear Chanel number no. five, um, Lang Lang is what is the fragrance within that uh, very expensive perfume. Because it is uh, where it undergoes that um, dist distillation process is another reason that it's so uh, expensive. Um, also, another popular phytochemical property is, um, or category is, is or are the enzymes. These are what we refer to as the organic catalysts because they're going to be essential for all chemical functions. So one way to illustrate this is through the utilization of facials, uh, but enzymes are going to be found in all plants. And it's often been said that without enzymes, um, there would be no life because basically what enzymes do is speed up all these chemical 
reactions in the body. So basically uh, compare these to honeybees. They're actually the worker bees, okay? They're, these enzymes are what really makes things happen. And just to break it down a little bit to kind of illustrate a little bit more, we have three different types. We have digestive enzymes, and some of you may be familiar with that because um, if you take a, um, oh my goodness, that just, anyway, there's digestive enzymes that you can take before a meal or, you know, those to help stimulate the good bacteria in your gut, all that good stuff. Those are kind of along the lines of digestive enzymes. Uh, we also have metabolic enzymes, and then we have the food or plant enzymes, which are what you see here. Um, generally, food and plant enzymes are going to be naturally present in raw food, so you can obtain all those, of course, by eating fresh, uh, raw, anything that's uncooked like fruits, veggies, eggs, um, unpasteurized, dairy, and, and fish. So if you look at what we've got pictured here, pineapples, aloe, uh, turmeric, ginger, papaya, uh, when, we, when we see those, that's something we naturally think about as um, calming and soothing the skin as well. But don't forget that they also play an important role in the digestive system. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, the major four here, but there is a link if you want to read up a little bit more on enzymes because they are a very important component, especially when it comes to uh, the power of plants. Uh, but next up, our category is gums. And this is one that um, it's got some cool info, but it's also maybe a little bit harder to understand. But gums are going to be those sticky substances that are going to be insoluble in organic solvents. And typically, as you see here, they're going to be produced as a result of a plant wound. Okay, so kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we move through the next few slides. So um, when we talk about gums, we're talking about polysaccharides. Okay, so when we hear saccharide, we know that there's a lot of sugars. Okay, so that just means that they're, they have those natural sugars um, built inside these plants and what happens is that they're capable of causing a large increase in viscosity, even when we use those in small concentrations. So hopefully this is going to make sense in a few minutes. But uh, primarily when we talk about gums, we talk about botanical gums. Okay, so they're going to be found in the woody elements of plants or within seed coatings. That's where those gums are going to naturally reside. So when we look at this plant here on the left, it's not one that we're going to be familiar with here. This is actually the cognac plant, um, and it's native to Asia, but the corm of this plant actually contains glucomannan fiber, which is used as an emulsifier and as a thickener. So some of you may be familiar with that terminology, glucomannan fiber. It's also touted for weight loss benefits. So if you purchase any of those over the counter, then you've probably seen that. Um, another one that's really popular comes from our plantain. You hear me talk about this one frequently. Uh, this is the one that the Native Americans called the white man's um, footsteps or the white man's weed because everywhere the white man trod, then this plant would spring forth. Uh, but plantain has got lots of properties, and you've heard me talk about this, especially in making uh, uh, salves for wounds on your skin because it does have those uh, powerful properties. Well, it kind of works the same way just from within the plant itself, because this plant is where we get psyllium seed. And I should have put this up here, the P-S-Y-L-L-I-U-M seed. And that comes from any member of the plantago, which plantain is, comes from that family. And these seeds are what's commercially used for the production of mucilage. And it's used as a dietary fiber. So this is what is touted for lowering your cholesterol um, and your blood sugar. So if you use Metamucil or any of those um, that are similar, then more uh, likely than not, plantain is going to be one of those ingredients, which is kind of cool. Now, you heard me talk about um, produced as a result of a plant wound, right? So when we go to this slide here, Many of you have probably seen this, especially on fruit trees. This is where it's typically the most prevalent. But gummosis or gumming syndrome, that's the release of this gum that you see here in response to an injury or a wound. So think about if you got there with your weed eater and you're, and you're trimming up and that string catches the bark of the tree. 
or even think about this year with cicada damage that we had, it opens up, you know, she's opened it up to lay her eggs. Um, anything like that that's going to injure that tree, especially fruit trees, then this is what's going to form. So it's almost like when we cut ourselves and we get a scab. It's basically kind of the same thing. But a true gum, like you see pictured here, is going to be formed from the disintegration of internal plant tissue. And that's from the decomposition of cellulose. So that's what we're seeing right here, decomposition of cellulose, and that's what's called gamosis. So that's what makes it a little bit different from a resin, just a resin being the coating within that seed or nut or derived from the root, whereas this is actually a sugar response to sealing that wound within a tree. To take it a little bit further, um, this red seaweed, which is edible, we don't see this here either, but this is the derivative of carrageenan. And this is what makes all these products kind of stick together, bind together, because it does have such a great thickening uh, property. No nutritional value whatsoever, but it is considered a food additive. So think about your toothpaste and your ice cream and all that good stuff. When you read the list of ingredients, oftentimes you're going to see carrageenan which on the table, I'm going to show you that in a few minutes, is listed as E407. Um, this picture here is actually a lagoon. Some of you may know it as astragalus, um, also called milk vetch. But gum, arab uh, gum arabic and then carob gum are two other gums. And the carob is actually coming from the carob locust tree. And gum ar arabic comes from the ac acacia tree. But this is where we get those special exudate gums. That's just acting as a defense mechanism for that plant. Okay, so uh, most of the time, these are going to um, actually create these gums that kind of thicken when they get when they come in contact with air and water, and that's where we actually will harvest those. That dried sap is extracted from the root or the stem, and that's what's going to be used as a thickener for salad dressings and ice cream. Um, to give it that texture. So anything that has an E number, and you'll see here E400 to 499, that's where these emulsifiers and stabilizers are going to come from, but they're going to be um, plant derived. If you smoke cigars, the cap that's utilized, um, put in place on the cap of that cigar, or what, you, what we call the flag leaf, we're also going to use um, one of these E emulsifiers to do that, and also they're going to be used in artist um, pastels as well. So kind of continuing on with that, you'll notice two more additives here, exanthem gum and guar gum. So um, if you've ever tried the keto diet, then you're probably familiar with exanthem gum um, because it is going to add bulk with no carbohydrates. But exanthem gum is actually uh, derived from a bacteria during fermentation process. The cool thing about exanthem gum is that it's the same bacteria that's going to be responsible for black rot on our cruciferous veggies. So think about broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage, and that's pretty prevalent here in northeast Tennessee. But this is exanthem most I can't talk tonight, y'all. Exanthem monast compestris when you look at the Latin book. Um, we just call that black rot. Um, another one that you see pictured here, the guar gum. This is actually the guar gum or the, the guar bean. Um, it's also known as guava bean. Uh, but the cool thing about this plant is it's never been found in the wild. But you're going to see this listed on a lot of um, labels because a lot of our food and beverages actually have that because it is going to be able to change the viscosity of some of those beverages or food source, and it's going to be a fiber source. And it's also used for cattle feeds, as well as cover crops, especially in nitrogen rotation, because it is a legume, so it's going to be nitrogen fixing. Um, it's also going to be used in fracking and then paper and textiles as well. So kind of unique when we get to talking about the big family of gums. Um, all of that coming just from a defense mechanism, um, built within that plant, it's just protecting itself. And then we derive so many things from that, um, even though it's in the source of additives like you see pictured here. Uh, another category are the glycosides. And this is a great big um, category as well. But glycosides are going to be substances that we break down by those enzymes that we were talking about earlier, 
that's going to yield a sugar and a therapeutic treatment. So what you see pictured here is the foxglove, which um, is where we get digitalis from, which is a cardiac glycoside. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the lima beans and all here in just a few minutes. But to move on to um, the white willow, this is Salix alba. Um, of course, we know from this is where we get aspirin. But just as an FYI, if you take bear aspirin, that's actually coming from um, Metasweet, which is a type of spirea because they discovered years ago that it was a little bit easier on the digestive system. It didn't cause as much upset. So spirea, omeria is actually where, again, bear aspirin is derived from. But it was first derived from the white willow. Um, a couple others, senna here is a, um, actually it's a legume as well, and then rhubarb, which is pretty popular here in Northeast Tennessee. And then one that I don't have pictured, but would be in the same category would be aloe. Um, all three of these are going to have laxative type properties. Um, it's anthraquinine, and that's considered a glycoside. Uh, Miralax is going to be made of, let's see, you should be able to see that, where's that on? Yeah, propylene glycol here. Whereas rhubarb and senna are going to be natural uh, to the system. So that's why a lot of people will choose one of these over uh, the synthetic formula, just as an FYI, but they're going to act very similar. Now, a subgroup of glycosides are going to be our flavonoids. And um, these are where we're going to get anthocyanins. And of course, those two are going to be a component of flavonoids. So we actually have over 5,000 naturally occurring flavonoids, and all of those are coming from all kinds of plants. So uh, even strawberries, which are pretty popular in the springtime, those are going to be a glycoside because they contain uh, pelargonidin, which is also going to be where the red comes from in geraniums. So if you look at the Latin name for geraniums, you're going to see um, that relationship there, but it's going to be that uh, pelargonidin is where that red is going to come from, hence the reason it's considered a flavonoid. Uh, parsley is going to be one of those herbs in our kitchen garden that has a tremendous amount of flavonoids, okay, super um, healthful, a lot of um, benefits. Um, in essence, of time, I won't go through all those, but if you're not growing parsley in your kitchen garden, you really need to be because uh, it's not just the garnish on the plate, it really does have some great health benefits. Uh, yet again, polyphenols are going to be a subgroup of flavonoids as well. Uh, just a few illustrations here. Um, antioxidants are going to be kind of umbrellaed here. So we hear that term thrown around a lot. Um, when we think about antioxidants and polyphenols, we want to think about anything that's red and blue. So when you see here the blueberries and the grapes, um, we know that those are high in, in um, antioxidants and the polyphenols, but a lot of people don't realize that peanuts, because they have that red skin, are also going to be very healthful and fall into the same category. So when we talk about polyphenol-rich beverages, um, this kind of probably illustrates pretty effectively a glass of red wine, again coming from those grapes, is going to have um, really high amounts of polyphenol. And you can kind of see how that compares to a lot of other beverages, including our um, black tea, which is going to come in at two cups, which is really good too. So um, that's black tea. Uh, the cool thing to remember about flavonoids, um, you get so many great things from these. Again, it's not just about the flavor and those health benefits, but we're also getting um, pollinator attractants through some of those. It's what's going to control the color of a lot of our flowers um, and the flavor. Uh, you'll see here seed germinations is going to occur as a result of this. Seed maturation, plant growth and development, all those stress management and allelochemicals. So all of these things are going to be kind of housed under that glycoside umbrella and flavonoids are going to be responsible for a lot of these plant processes um, that actually get that plant to grow. So think about um, enzymes. You're going to have a lot of those kind of uh, playing into this as well, kind of working in tandem together. Now, when we talk about um, a lot of these, we also need to mention apricots and bamboo shoots, um, cassava, elderberries, which was on that slide I showed you a few minutes ago, 
uh, flaxseed, lima beans. Um, all of these are actually related because they are a source of cyanide. Um, they contain those cyanogenic glycosides, um, bitter almond, elderberry, eucalyptus, um, wild cherry is even going to fall into that category too. Think about wild cherry when it wilts, it's toxic to um, cattle. Um, the reason for that is because of those cyanogenic glycosides. So glycosides can be great. Um, they can also have some detriment if we're not careful with that. Um, but we do have plants as, as well as bacteria, fungi, algae that can produce cyanide. And it's going to be found in a naturally occurring in a number of plants, almost 3,000 plants. And these are just phytochemicals that, we, again, we're referring to these as um, cyanogenic glycosides. And so they basically have one carbon, so what that means, with sugar added to it. So um, as we got smarter and started breeding um, plants, we took a lot of those cyanogenic compounds, compounds out. So to illustrate that, lima beans, if you were to look at an old cookbook from colonial era, uh, the early pioneer days here in Southern Appalachian, and then you're going to find um, those recipes actually saying to, to boil those in an open pot to break down those cyanogenic glycosides because they were really um, high um, in those older varieties because boiling repeatedly um, twice is going to remove a lot of those compounds, but it's going to leave that sugar, which makes the beans not only safer to eat, but also sweeter to eat. So that's, that's kind of the difference. That's where a lot of that has now been bred out. Uh, when we take cassava and consider some of our poor countries in the world, um, we see a lot of that cyanide poisoning. And the reason for that is because cassava is such a staple in those countries. So that's why we see a lot of that even, um, even still today. That would be the reason for that are, are because of those cyanogenic compounds. Uh, moving on to our next category, we're going to talk a little bit about saponins. And basically, um, saponins, we kind of directly and indirectly relate to soap, okay? So you'll see there, they're emulsifying and irritating, uh, toxic, similar to soap. They're going to be related to steroids, which yield sex um, hormones like estrogen and cortisol. So um, these are going to be found in most vegetables, beans and herbs, just naturally occurring. Uh, think about your soybeans and your peas and even any herb that has soap in the name. And we're going to talk about some of these here in a few minutes, but like uh, soap wort, I think that's actually the next one we are going to talk about. Um, but they gained their name because they form a lather when you combine them with water. So they're found especially in plant skins and they're going to form this waxy protective coating. And um, it actually is going to help turn on the immune system within that plant. And it's actually considered a natural antibiotic for that. Um, plant. So you see picture there, ginseng, we know that it helps improve physical stamina as well as mental uh, performance and it helps promote longevity. But it's actually promoting uh, metabolism and growth of normal cells and accelerates the development of both the brain and body and increases muscle mass and has all these great traits. Um, it can actually um, enhance fertility and all that good stuff, which is where it's related to the sex hormones um, and the steroids, if you will. But when we talk about a true saponin too, the kind of where we gained a lot of this knowledge was through some of these naturally foaming um, plants like soap work, which is what you see here. Um, it um, actually was probably the first soap that we used here um, it, with our um, early settlers and pioneers, again, because the roots and the leaves actually will form those bubbles. It's really cool. And then the Romans actually used this as a water softener years ago. And then farmers would make a soap out of this plant and bathe the sheep before they sheared the sheep to clean the wool. And then colonists, uh, they brought the plant with them to use as that soap um, substitute. So basically, you're just chopping it up boiling it in water, and then it creates a cleanser. And you're going to find that actually uh, a lot of these plants that have these saponin properties are going to be used in a lot of skincare products um, today. Yucca is another plant that has those saponin uh, properties, and you can actually utilize that as a cleanser as well. 
Um, blue cohosh and calendula that we see here. Um, we're going to utilize the blue cohosh in the dietary supplement form. Um, the Native Americans love this one as, as well as black cohosh, but black cohosh doesn't have those saponin properties as much as the blue cohosh. But it was utilized as a uterine tonic, um, and it just helped improve um, the muscle tone in the uterus um, when they were birthing babies. And then calendula, uh, we have a couple different kinds of calendula, but the calendula resina species especially is what we will actually utilize in a lot of um, bath and, and beauty products because of those saponic properties. Uh, moving on to another category, tannins. Um, this, this is probably one of my favorites. Those that know me know that um, I'm a wine drinker, especially red wine, and I like tannins. Uh, but these um, tannins are what give those um, astringency compounds. Um, it also helps the blood um, proteins to um, coagulate. But you see a lot of um, plants there, um, cocoa, wine, tea, coffee, even cinnamon, all of those are going to be um, high in tannins. Um, tannins are also going to be a glycoside. You will all um, actually hear that referred to as tannic acid sometimes too, but they're water soluble polyphenols and you're going to find this present not just in these foods but in a lot of other plants too. So if you've ever drunk a glass of red wine and your um, tongue gets a little fizzy or the sides of your mouth, then those are tannins at work. Um, if you like raspberries, um, that's also going to be high in tannins as well as yarrow. It's got a lot of high tannins. Um, any herb that has tannins, high amounts of tannins, are going to tighten up tissues like varicose veins. Um, they can drive any kind of watery secretion. So think about diarrhea or protect any kind of damaged uh, skin like acne or eczema. Uh, stop bleeding. Um, think about yarrow, the blood clotting. And it's also going to kind of help keep um, infections in check. So we've got a lot of plants with tannins, so think um, artichokes, borage, um, cassia, chamomile, comfrey, ephedra, hawthorn, hops, vervain, witch hazel, yarrow, dock, poplar, rhubarb, and tansy. All of those are going to have high amounts of um, tannins in those plants. That's why if you think about those plants I just listed, you've heard me mention those before in some of our medicinal herbs because they do have those high amounts of tannins, it's also going to help um, create a medicinal effect. So that is that is one of the reasons why are because of the tannins. Uh, when we look at the English oak, we know that years ago it was considered a pagan symbol, but there were so many things that the oak gave us, uh, more specifically tannins. But now we did also use the acorns um, as a food, uh, food source. It was used as a coffee substitute, believe it or not, years ago. Um, early settlers would feed acorns to the hogs to fatten them up um, before slaughter, but it's really this oak bark that has given us a great source of, of tannin. So, of course, I've got the barrel here because anytime we age red wine in those oak barrels, we're going to get tannin, tannic acid or a high amount of tannins. Um, we also will find nut galls that are going to be formed as a result, and those nut galls are also going to have high amounts of tannins too, and oftentimes those are going to be removed and utilized as medication, believe it or not. Um, just as an FYI, when we look at the English oak, we've got many different ones. If you're a wine drinker, you're, you'll hear uh, French oak or Slavonian oak. Um, those are both going to be English oaks, and those are going to be used in wine making. Uh, when we talk about that grain of the oak is what is going to yield a different amount of tannic acid. So Slavonian oak, which is uh, not from Slovenia, it's actually from um, an, an area in Croatia. Um, those Slavonian oak has a tighter grain than the French oak, so you're going to get less tannin because of that. Um, that's why we see French oak utilized so much in red wine because it's going to impart more tannic acid, which is going to give you more fizzy on the tongue, just as an FYI. Uh, when we talk about other plants that are high in tannins, uh, we can't forget um, tarragon. This is considered the king of herbs in France, and we think the reason for that is because it is um, the high tannic acid content. Uh, if you've ever eaten Bernays sauce um, or utilized this finesse herbs blend, 
that's also going to include chives and parsley and chervil, but tarragon is going to be uh, what gives it that pungent, bittersweet flavor. It's going to almost have that licorice, um, anise, kind of a, kind of a menthol flavor. But that's going to be found in any plant that has that licorice flavor. It's, you know that is going to tell you it's very high in uh, tannins. And then as we move on to the next category, we uh, are looking at mucilage. You've heard me say mucinologinous a couple of times already tonight, but mucilage is a viscous gum that swells into a gel in water. And the biggest thing is that it's used to soothe that irritated or inflamed skin. So they're deriving their properties, again, from sugars that they naturally contain, that word polysaccharide again. And when we look at polysaccharides, they're giving us like a slippery, mild taste, but then they also swell in water. And that's where we're getting that gel-like mass. And that is what is going to help protect and soothe irritated tissues, not only externally, but internally as well. This one here is the marshmallow. And uh, we had a master gardener a few years ago do a presentation on this, and it was just fabulous. Uh, but the cool thing about marshmallow is that they have these ring-shaped fruit which are what we call cheeses. And it's these that we use in cosmetics because of these mucinologenous properties. So ladies, if you're wearing mascara and that viscous substance, that's coming from some of these plants that are naturally mucinologenous. Um, the roots of the marshmallow actually uh, contain natural sugars and they were used in those early um, medicinal sweets. And then hence the original marshmallow was born. Um, yet again, we have another category, vitamins and minerals. We didn't want to omit this one because oftentimes when we talk about those phytochemical elements, we um, will kind of leave out vitamins and minerals because it's one of those things we all, we all hear every day and it's on the forefront of our minds. Um, but these are going to be required for various metabolic functions, but unlike enzymes, they're not going to be catalysts. So remember enzymes are going to be instrumental for speeding up any of those chemical processes, whereas vitamins and minerals are just going to be there for those metabolic functions. So a couple that I kind of picked out was calcium and, and vitamin D. Um, I've always said if you, if you like kale and you're eating it for the health benefits, then try stinging nettles which is urtica dioecia, because they're going to be higher in mineral content, especially the calcium that you see here. Now, a lot of people, when I talk about cooking those or eating those, are like, you know, those stingy, prickly things. But when you cook or dry or soak those, that's going to deactivate that sting uh, when you touch those. So that's going to, that's going to take that out. Um, it is considered a very healing food. It's going to be a, a general tonic. It's a nutritive a good um, blood building herb. So at its peak ripeness, it's gonna contain up to 25% dry weight protein. And that's really high, even higher than kale when we look at it for a, a leafy green vegetable. And then vitamins, we know that those are gonna be responsible for any type of regulation and promoting any type of vital functions in our bodies. Um, but vitamin D, uh, we, we usually associate that with getting out in the sunshine or we associate that with drinking dairy and absolutely that is. But you're also going to find it in alfalfa, like you see pictured here. You're going to find it in eye bright, carrots, um, fenugreek, even mullein that we see blooming right now, um, dandelion, chickweed, lemongrass, lettuce and parsley. And I mentioned parsley earlier again, and that's another reason that it is touted um, so much because it does have high amounts of vitamin D as well. Now to just kind of wrap us up, we're going to shift out of some of those phytochemical properties and just think about maybe some plants that we've not hit on already in these categories, but just want to make you aware of, again, the power of plants. So this is our balsam fir or the she balsam. So the reason for that is that resin milking from the, from the bark blisters, um, the he balsam is actually going to be the red spruce, which is a, the Fraser is a subspecies um, of the spruce. So typically we're going to see this in those northern climates, but at elevations higher than 5,500, we're going to see this here. But one of the products that we derive from this balsam fir is going to be any of this turpentine or varnishes that we use 
but also we're going to utilize this in uh, potpourri and toiletries and even in cough drops, y'all. So a lot of great things come from those Frasers. Um, sugar maple or the Acer saccharum. This is um, often planted just because of the beauty of the bright orange color in the fall, but it is going to produce the sweetest maple syrup of all maple syrups. Um, this is the silver birch or the Betula pendula. Um, the cool thing about the birch that we probably normally wouldn't think about is that it's going to produce a really bright and vivid green and yellow dye. Um, and I saw Annie when we first logged on, so I didn't, I don't know if you know that, Annie, but I thought that was really cool. Very, very vivid green and yellow dye. But the sap is also going to be used in syrups and in wines and vinegars. And then the um, bark is waterproof. So they're going to be used to dress uh, or scent and actually give uh, durability to Russian leather. That was one of the, the primary uses for the silver birch. And then the bark and bud oil is going to be used in uh, medicated soaps, like you see pictured here. Um, a tree that we're starting to see grow in popularity because it is going to be one of those natives is the quince. It is one of the, the world's oldest cultivated plants. And if you'll notice there from that picture of mascara, we know that it does in fact have those mucinologenous properties. So it is gonna be used um, in the production of cosmetics, but it's also going to yield a beautiful pink jelly uh, when you cook it down um, because, um, and it, oh, and again, the seeds are what are mucinologenous here. You can't really eat this fruit raw, but it's great for pies, jellies, and jams. Um, the ginkgo tree. This is going to be the most common tree street in the U.S. At least a couple of years ago, it was. Um, it is considered a living fossil. It's about 200 million years um, old, which is what makes it a living fossil. Uh, the females will actually produce fruit if the male is nearby. There used to be one of these outside the Washington County Extension Office. And if I'm not mistaken, when I was down there for something a month, a month or so ago, I think that tree is gone because it was a female tree. So it would drop its fruit and it's really stinky fruit. If you've never smelled a, a female ginkgo, um, not only does it smell bad, but it's a very messy tree. Uh, but ginkgo is touted for improving brain efficiency and cellular energy. Uh, we, see, we see that touted all the time. But we know that this is a very, um, it has a lot of tenacity. And we saw this because the reason um, that ginkgo is so popular is because when, the, um, when we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima in Japan, there were actually six ginkgo trees that were growing less than a mile uh, from the drop zone. And um, this, this is one of the few things that's still living today. It, it actually survived that blast. So even though plants and animals and everything um, in the area were killed in 1945, um, these were charred and they were burned up pretty bad. Um, but just within a few years, they were healthy and living again. And, um, and the six trees are still alive, at least as of um, a couple of years ago. Uh, the sweet gum tree, when you actually crush these leaves, they're going to release a um, fragrance, which is why it's called sweet gum. Uh, the bark is what's actually going to produce that resin. And it's going to be utilized in perfumes and incense and even fumigation. Um, asthma patients, um, the, the resin is going to be used as an expectorant in those inhalers. So it does have a really good medicinal use as well. But usually it's going to be used in cosmetics. Um, just as an FYI, the Flight 93 that went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, they planted a sweet gum uh, to commemorate that, that plant. The sassafras tree, it's a very highly aromatic tree. It's got outstanding fall foliage, which makes it very popular in landscapes. Um, but the cool thing about this plant, we get so many things from this plant. First of all, the Native Americans loved it because they used every part of this, this tree. Um, if you like Cajun food, gumbo, gumbo filet um, is actually going to be um, dried up powder, or the ground leaves are used as a dried powder um, as that seasoning for gumbo. Uh, you'll notice there, too, that saffron is going to be that oil that's extracted, and that's was what was made to use uh, root beer. It was also used in toothpaste. It was used in perfumes. Of course, now that saffron has been banned for a root beer, but that was the original root beer. Just as an FYI, the largest sassafras tree 
um, is in Owensboro, Kentucky, which is up along the Ohio River, um, northwest of Nashville, I guess. It's over 100 foot high and it's about 21 foot around. So that's kind of cool. Um, this is the European mountain ash or the sorbus. Um, it's going to flower in the spring and fall. It's an excellent wildlife habitat, food, as you can see. But the cool thing is that the berries are really rich in vitamin C. Um, so it's going to be actually great in jams, jellies, and wines, but also it's used as a flower substitute or to enhance the flavor of flour, believe it or not. Um, the seeds are going to be one of those that contain the hydrocyanogenic acid, but we know that we can cook that out. Um, this is also going to be a tree that was used as a country charm against witchcraft. So if you've ever gone to Scotland, this is one that you will probably see these in souvenir stores and everything because it is said to protect against the witchcraft. Um, the plant was actually called the witch in England and they would use dowsing rods to find ores uh, made out of its out of its wood. And then um, they would actually use twigs to drive the cattle into the pasture for the first time in the springtime because they said that that would help promote the fertility and the health of those cattle all year long. Um, here's a plant that um, you'll either hear good or bad about this plant. This is the yew, the taxus baccata. Um, you either love it as a landscape plant or you don't. It's a very slow growing plant, but it's also long lived. Why um, is one reason folks really like this. You'll see this on a lot of the um, homes that are about 100 to 150 years old. Um, but this plant also generates an alkaloid called taxol. So you may have heard that in cancer research. It's being um, continually conducted on that. Um, another cool use for the U is that you can burn the wet needles to create a smoldering insecticidal smoke. And that's going to help repel gnats and skeeters. So if you have access to you and you're sitting around your burn, pit uh, or fire pit, you can throw a few wet needles in there and it'll help drive them off. Um, the other cool thing about you is that we don't think about it as being a wood that we use in anything, but it's often used in bows and in axe handles. And we have evidence of this being found um, with the Iceman in the European Alps. Uh, we consider the wood from a U as, as a closed, poor, soft wood. So think about your cedars and your pines. It's gonna be very similar to that. Uh, the reason that we like this wood for bow handles and axe handles is because it's really easy to work. It's very friable. So it's gonna be the hardest of those softwoods, but it's got great elasticity. So that's why it, it makes it ideal for anything that's requiring any type of springiness, such as the bows. Um, this picture right here is one of the oldest living artifacts today. It's known as the Claxton, Claxton Spear. Um, I can't remember exactly where that's at. But um, the cool thing, again, about these yews is that they can live up to 400 to 600 years. And the entire yew bush, the entire taxus plant, except the arrow, which is the red flesh of the berry that covers the seed here, um, is poisonous. So that's where those alkaloids are actually coming from. And that's what's used in that cancer research. Um, this is your linden or your basswood. Um, this tree is going to be really hard to ID because they hybridize um, so freely. So think about Bradford pears. Y'all heard me harp on that a few weeks ago. Um, Self-hybridizing, it's the same thing with the basswood. But some of the best honey you'll ever eat is the linden honey. Um, it does. Um, it is probably a little bit more expensive, but it is some of the world's most um, valued honey. And the flowers are really super sweet. They were actually utilized in um, tobacco years ago. They would smoke that in their peace pipes and use it to flavor both snuff and cigarette tobacco. I wanted to make mention of cotton because it's um, one of our big fiber plants. So we get our blue jeans and t-shirts, uh, cotton seed oil, all of that um, comes from the mighty um, cotton plant. Uh, just as an FYI, those flowers actually change color. And let's see, there was something else I was going to mention about cotton, but I can't remember. Oh, it's being researched as a male contraceptive. Um, I'm not sure what the status is of that, but there is a link in the notes to read up on that. Um, here's a plan. I just wanted to put it in here because we're starting to see this on um, health 
um, health store uh, shelves and everything. This is the Macopa. So this is a plant that grows pretty prolifically, even in, in mud. You can tell here it's a, it's a succulent plant. So think about your sedums in your landscape. No relation there, but um, it's going to be kind of similar to that or a jade plant, the consistency. But a lot of people will eat Macopa because it does have a really bitter and pungent taste. And many cultures around the world um, treat um, epilepsy. Uh, they use it um, in Western, Eastern medicine uh, for the yin and the yang. They use it to stimulate the yang energy. So uh, a lot of people also use this just in um, aquariums in their homes. Black cohosh, you've, you've heard me talk about this uh, multiple times. Native Americans use this for ease of childbirth and as a um, antidote for snake bite. We're seeing Joe Pye bloom right now. Um, it does have um, a place in cancer research. It's showing potential and anti-tumor properties. And I see I'm getting close on time, so I'm going to zip through these last few. Um, lupines, you've heard me mention that before in cover crops. Um, it is something, though, that can spread really bad, so you don't want to get into that unless you're going to be able to control that. Um, but it's great to use um, for oily or acne-prone skin. The seeds are going to be utilized as a coffee substitute or even a flower um, substitute. Um, they are a nitrogen fixer, great as a green manure. Uh, the, the biggest thing about them is that they absorb excess poisons and chemicals from the soil. So when the Chernobyl um, catastrophe happened, blue pines were planted around Chernobyl to absorb that radiation poisoning um, after that nuclear disaster. And then pyrethrum, which comes from the pyrethrum daisy. Um, this has given us a very popular um, insecticide that we use in our gardens, the, the pyrethrum. Um, active ingredients become toxic um, if it's highly concentrated, so be, be aware of that. Um, just a few more and we're, we'll get you out of here. Um, we'll look at some plants, maybe not always think about, the, the cashew. Uh, we actually call these swollen stems apples. And then that protruding kidney-shaped fruit is actually the, the, the nut itself. Um, in Asia, they eat all parts of this plant. They actually will make an alcoholic spirit there called kujuado. Um, and then the leaf, the flower, the bark, and the oil are all going to be poisonous. So like I say, they eat this in Asia, but they're cooking that um, and they're using it medicinally. But the oil of this plant is very caustic, believe it or not. Um, but they also use um, the fruit, the apple, to uh, make dye for travel paints and such. Um, this is the jackfruit or the autocarpus. It's an evergreen shade tree. Uh, notice here that the fruit grows directly from the trunk. The cool thing about jackfruit is that a lot of folks are utilizing that as the next big meat substitute. And when I say big, I mean big. You can see how big that fruit is. Uh, but it's also going to be. Um, the color of, it's going to be, well, the trunks actually yield this yellow dye that you see the monks wearing, which is kind of cool. And then carob, I've kind of bounced around this one a little bit uh, tonight. You can probably tell by looking at this one that it is a legume. It's a very drought resistant, shrubby, little dense tree. Um, it's going to produce these little green pods. And these are what's really sugar rich. Um, in, in pulp, they contain the protein, vitamins, and these little hard beans on the inside like you see right here. Um, this pulp is actually going to be used as an alternative to chocolate flavoring, and that's going to give you a caffeine-free food. It's also going to be utilized as the coloring agent for bouillon cubes. So if you still use the bouillon cube next time you open a square, think about um, the humble um, carob tree here. And then the beans, this is a jeweler's original carrot measure. Okay, so one carob seed actually equaled one carrot when they were talking about diamonds. And then they also will use this to make a coffee substitute again because it is caffeine free. Um, this is the one I'm working on this for later. And I don't know if that's one of the August or one of the ones that we're going to talk about maybe in November, but we're going to talk about some of these notable herbs. Um, I've been working on this for a few months now, so I'm hopefully y'all are really going to enjoy that, but we're going to get into some of those plants with a lot of hefty alkaloids, if you will, and talk about some of these uh, ancient treasures 
um, that were used in a lot of conspiracies way back in the day. And um, even some of these that are causing us problems today, like the poison hemlock and the water hemlock, or even the jimson weed. Y'all have probably heard, um, I think teenagers are smoking the jimson weed again. But we'll talk more about some of those a little bit later in the year. And with that, we are going to conclude tonight. And let's see, where did everybody go? There we go. All right, so I will check out the chat box and get all this stuff sent out to you in the next day or two. And I hope y'all enjoyed tonight. And we'll just kind of build on that for the rest of the month. And I will see y'all next Monday night at 630. Thanks, y'all. Good night, Melody. Night.